for interview to Bangalore. This was in the Indian Institute of Science campus. The TIFR had a center in the Indian Institute of Science campus. And I went there for the interview not knowing anything. Uh, and luckily I got selected for that job. And to be honest, that's where I found uh, you know, what I want to do. Because I started doing radio astronomy instrumentation. And that is microwave, uh, you know, circuit building and stuff like that. And that's where my eyes opened up completely because I was in interacting with world-class physicists, astrophysicists and instrument of all the people around me. They are from all, you know, renowned Indian institutions like Indian Institute of Science and IITs. And uh, they are all smart people. Uh, you know, for me, I used to feel that I have started a hundred meter race where everyone has already reached 50 meters and I'm just uh, started my running. And so there's so much to learn, and but that's where I actually it uh, started thinking that maybe microwave is a very interesting field. So in, in TIFR, uh, as I said, I actually had great experience. Uh, TIFR is one of the institutes in India where is very different from any other institute. I, so now I know more about other Indian institutes because I go. I'm a visiting professor at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. I go to of the IITs. I have IIT Kharagpur. I am a uh, adjunct professor. So I know about infrastructures and all. But TIFR is completely different because it's open in the sense you can go to your boss and you know kick on his door and shout at him and tell him that he's wrong. And they won't mind it. Uh, so that kind of, so I am a, I was a very young engineer, just out of college. I didn't have much knowledge, to be honest, didn't know much. And then there was a person called Professor Gobind Swarup. Uh, so he, if you Google him, he's a very famous astrophysicist as well. So he is an FRS, Fellow of Royal Society and all those stuff. He started, he's kind of the father of Indian radio astronomy. So he was the director of that place and then uh, we started interacting with him and I started learning things and after about I actually built one part of this uh, uh, instrument called giant meter wave radio telescope GMRT that is in Pune and then I started you know working there and then about after a few years when I built the stuff that I was supposed to build then I thought you know what I need more formal studies I need to do a master's uh, and then I at the time I was not really thinking about PhD uh, then um, I applied to few places and University of Virginia I got admission with uh, a, a research assistantship and that's how I accepted the offer and I came over You know that, uh, of course, uh, one of the things, the first thing I noticed that infrastructure wise, uh, US universities are much better, uh, better off. But again, my experience of undergraduate was from B college, right? It was not from one of the IITs and all. So, uh, but I now know what are the infrastructure, uh, what are the facilities are there in other, uh, in higher, uh, good quality Indian institutes. Uh, of course, there I, you know, they are good, but uh, the way what I found is even today in Indian, maybe it has changed a little bit, but still there is kind of a, a deference to the professors in the sense that we still do not really ask that many questions when uh, a class is taught, uh, that we generally uh, are quiet. We listen to the professor uh, teaching, take our notes and go back. But here I found that the education is much more interactive. So uh, it's about the students, they don't, they're not really afraid of asking questions. If you don't understand, they ask, uh, you know, even if we feel like, you know, sometimes you feel, oh, this is, I don't know, but maybe I'll go back and try to find out what it is, right? That is the kind of. Uh, attitude we have that even if you don't understand something we don't really ask and our uh, attitude is that we'll go back read it up and find out what it exactly is but here I found that they, they, they don't hold back they just ask the question they, okay I didn't understand can, can we explain it again so that is one 
and the laboratories and all the facilities were different there and also what happens in the masters i was working with uh, students who are doing the phd's and so it was kind of more of a collaborative environment so you get into a project and then you start working with people and so it, it, and then you know you go to the lab and a lot of things are lab based in the sense that whatever you think about doing you try to build something and then try to explore does it work because when you build something uh, you get a completely different kind of experience compared to what you, when you do a paper design right so that is one of the thing that i found so it's kind of uh, uh, coming from india upon uh, the education background that i had i felt that oh okay this is the next level so uh, so that's what i found uh, let me tell a little bit you know go back in time i like telling stories so uh, let me tell you stories so growing up as i said growing up in here especially in calcutta a lot of people at the time we had some fascination about few things one of the thing was you know nasa of course uh, because i actually grew up in a very poor family we are six brothers and sisters we had only one room uh uh you know at our home uh this is 12 by 14 feet home and we uh the uh, is brick wall there's no plasters on the wall and the floor was uh, mud uh so you didn't have even a uh, you know cement floor and uh there lying on the bed in the night, late night i used to think about you know nasa science and all those stuff this is kind of dream right and one thing is for poor people for everyone else it, dreaming it doesn't cost anything so you can dream you can dream big and what's wrong with that you know i mean at the end of the day of course you kind of you are afraid of talking about your dreams to others because people will laugh at it you said okay how can you even think of going to nasa uh, you are here look at where you are so that uh, you know that is a very common phenomenon i know that i'm not alone even today a lot of people maybe are at your nit has similar background you know that they are not really well off they are really struggling and also if our interview reaches to other people outside who maybe some uh, someone in a village similar kind of situation where he's think that i don't have a future i am you know stuck here in my life so i want to tell them that you know don't think that way because if you dream big of course and you work hard for it is possible i know there are a lot of road blocks it is not easy uh, there will be a lot of hardships on your way but if you really dream to become something and you put your heart and mind to it you can do that and similar way you know the story that when i was working at uh, tifr i was writing down on my notebook dr gautam chattopadhyay california institute of technology i see i was working at tifr i have not applied anywhere nothing just in my you know you do that you know doodling and then my doodling was that i am writing i didn't have a phd i was just an undergrad you know undergraduate degree but i am writing dr gautam chatterjee california institute of technology and one of my friends saw it and he started laughing at me say hey when are you going to caltech uh, uh, i was a little bit embarrassed that he saw uh, what i wrote but you know that was in the back of my mind and then when i came to virginia i was doing my masters and i wanted to do my phd and i was brave as i said you know you have to be brave i decided to apply for phd but i could have done my phd at virginia because my advisor had told me to do phd there and i told him that i'm going to apply to three universities only to do my phd if i don't get admission from all those three then i'll do my phd here and my advisor is very open in, in, you know this kind of thing you cannot sometimes tell in india because your professor will be very upset what do you think you know uh, so i i told him openly and he said oh sure go ahead and as i said i was brave because oh maybe 
somewhat foolish as well. Uh, I applied to three places. One was Caltech, obviously, California Institute of Technology. Other was MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and University of California at Berkeley, these three. And I was really lucky. I got admission from all three. Uh, then I went and asked my uh, advisor, what do I do? Where do I go? And it turns out that my uh, master's thesis advisor, he was, he did his PhD from Caltech. So of course he said, go to Caltech. And I think that was one of the best advice I got because when I came to Caltech to do my PhD, it was different. It is still now I can sometimes pinch myself and uh, see the, is it still I'm dreaming? You know, those dreams that I used to have, uh, you know, uh, growing up or is this real? Because uh, when I was doing my PhD, every year in the winter, a couple of uh, rooms from my office used to be uh, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking used to sit there because, you know, uh, uh, England winter is bad. So he used to come to Caltech every year and he used to sit in the same floor, only a couple of down, couple of uh, rooms down my office. So I used to see him, I used to, you know, even talk to him, he's going down in the elevator and stuff, talk to him, of course, through his speech synthesizer. And I interacted with people who are Nobel laureates. You know, for a couple of years ago, uh, Keith Thorne, he got Nobel Prize for discovering um, uh, gravitational waves. So he used to come to talk to uh, Stephen Hawking and I'm walking down in the you know roads on, on Caltech campus and I meet someone going by me the Nobel laureate in chemistry in physics so it is kind of a different environment altogether and I was finishing up my PhD and then um, I was thinking what to do then I got a call one day on my phone uh, saying that okay I'm so and so uh, his name was Peter Siegel. He said that I'm calling from uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, we know about your work because I wrote a few papers at that time. By then, he said that I would love you to come over and talk to us. So, here the interviews, at least for uh, you know research level, is slightly different. Uh, so, what you do is they ask you to go over there, you give a talk, and then you spend the entire day with different people go around and they are not asking you to solve something on the board or something so you just interact with them and then they kind of find out who you are what kind of uh, you know uh, outlook you have how do you think those things they observe and then i got a job offer so they said okay join us so that's how i landed up at nasa Yes, good question. Is you know, I I after I did my PhD, I started really enjoying the research-oriented area, like the research work. So uh, before, uh, actually, just when I accepted my job from uh, uh, NASA, I uh, got a call uh, from uh, Agilent. You know, if, uh, microwave engineers. You know, Agilent that was Hewlett Packard before, and then it became Agilent Technologies, and nowadays they call it Keysight. So this, this, this company, uh, Hewlett Packard company, so I got a call from them. Uh, they also uh, wanted uh, me to, uh, you know, work at HP. So they called me and they said, why don't you come over for an interview? And uh, so, of course, you know, industry jobs are much better paid. So the job offer that I had from NASA, if I had taken up the job from Hewlett Packard, it would have been at least twice. Uh, in terms of salary but I actually did not go for the interview because I told them that I already committed myself to uh, NASA so I'm not going and of course my uh, aim and my kind of dream was to work for NASA uh, but again if even if I had not gotten there at that time I think I would have still pursued that perhaps that you know as I said I am kind of uh, don't want to give up, right? You will try hard. So I would have, maybe I would have landed up somewhere else, but keep trying and maybe contacted someone. At that time, I did not contact anyone uh, to go to NASA, but I would have contacted. So either I would have landed up somehow 
at NASA or I would have continued my work in some kind of research environment or maybe become a faculty as well. So I don't know. So, uh, you know, this question is asked to me a lot of times that what do I do? Right. What is my role? Uh, so one of the things that we do, you know, one of the thing for NASA is that our role, even though background wise, we are engineers. I you know all my uh, background, I have done undergraduate engineering, and my PhD, master's, PhD, all in engineering uh, field, right? But when I came to NASA that I realized that how NASA works is very different than other organizations. So most of the work we do is driven by science. So let's say when we plan for any mission to anywhere, let's go to Mars or you know Jupiter or whatever, it all starts with a science question. So basically how it works is when you write proposals as well, first thing is that we are trying to answer a big science question. One of the, uh, I'll give an example and then maybe it, it will get clear. Let's say we are trying to understand, we know that when our art was created, we didn't have water. And scientists believe that the comets actually brought water to Earth. Now, if I say this to you, and you are going to say, uh, how do you know? How do you prove this, right? That water actually was brought to Earth by comets. The one of the way to answer that question uh, will be to do some experiments, right? So the bigger science question here that when, suppose you are planning a mission to answer this big science question, did comets bring water to Earth? This is the big science question we are trying to answer. The next question will be that, what kind of measurements you can do to answer that question, right? So the one kind of measurement you can do is that if you think about water, that water that we drink every day is H216O, you know, the 16th oxygen isotope. Uh, so that is water that we drink every day. But you know, there are other kinds of water. One is H217O, H218O, that is 18th and 17th oxygen isotope. And that also forms water. HDO, that, you know, one hydrogen, one deuterium, and okay. one water, uh, you know, atom makes uh, uh, HDO, another kind of water. D2O, D2O is heavy water. So there are different kinds of water. And it turns out that if you take the ratio of the abundances, how much of these different kinds of water is there, if you make take a ratio, you'll find that, that this ratio is a kind of very important. It tells you the source of the water. In a sense, if the comets brought water, water, you'll find the comets has the same ratio as our art, the ratio on the art. So our science question you are trying to answer is, did comets bring water to water? The measurements that you can do is to make this measurement, make the ratio of different kinds of water. The next question is, what kind of, you know, what kind of instruments you need to make that measurement? You can do, you know, build lots of different kinds of instruments, uh, different kinds of frequencies. You know, it can be a mass spectrometer. It can be a, you know, millimeter wave spectrometer. It can be a, you know, terahertz spectrometer, all kinds of different options you have. Then you, you are proposing, you are saying, I want to use this kind of instrument to make this ratio measurement to answer the question, did comet bring water to art? And so one of my instrument concept that I am working on, I have been working on for a while, is to do answer this question about this comet uh, water question, because it has not been settled. It's a, an outstanding question. We have made some measurements. So I am actually currently building some instrument uh, to do that. Yeah, I, the name of my instrument that I'm building, I'm the uh, principal investigator on that, is called WhatsApp. There's an acronym, Water Hunting Advanced Terahertz Spectrometer on an ultra small platform. So why I came up with that acronym is that we, you know, we want to answer this question, what's up with water? What is going on with water? And so that's what we, I'm building instruments for that. So I have developed a lot of new technologies for that to build that kind of instrument. And idea is that uh, on a small CubeSat platform, we'll go to uh, some comets 
and do those measurements. So that is one. Another thing that I am working on, I have worked on and still working on is, you know, cosmology. Cosmology is that, uh, you know, our universe was created uh, from a big bang. That's the current model that we think that about 13 point, uh, you know, 85 billion year ago, there was an explosion that big bang happened. And from there, our universe was created. And Einstein has a theory that during that time when it was created uh, at the beginning of the universe, because we are dealing with so, uh, you know, amount of mass and high density masses we are dealing with, that it must have created gravitational wave. That is theory of Einstein. And we are trying to actually prove that theory. That did it really happen? And one of the way to prove is through some measurements is called polarization measurement you know at that at the beginning of the universe after about 385,000 years after the universe was created the first electromagnetic wave came out because if you actually go back in time you can see right in time that what happened and and if you want to go back in time in electromagnetics like you know waves microwaves or light you can go back only up to about 385,000 years after Big Bang because there are no radiation came out before that time. And then we are actually, that is the first radiation that came out, it's called Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, CMB. Actually, two uh, uh, you know, scientists got Nobel Prize for that when they first discovered it. Uh, the name was Wilson, Bob Wilson and Penzias. They got this Nobel Prize. They first detected it. And we, what we are trying to do is if it turns out that if gravitational wave existed at that time, as Einstein predicted, then this cosmic micro background signal would get polarized. You know, polarization of light. You all know that because if you have a camera, you can put a polarizer on your camera so that you can cut the reflections, right? So that way, if you measure the polarization of the cosmic micro background signal, it and that polarization, one kind of polarization would have happened only if there was gravitational waves. So if you can measure that polarization of cosmic micro background, you can infer that, you know, it happened because of cos uh, you know, uh, the gravitational waves. So it's a kind of indirect way of proving. So I am building a part of a team, building instrumentation to do that measurement. It's extremely difficult measurement to do. A lot of people around the world are trying to do that, and uh, because you need very high sensitivity, you have to build the most sensitive receivers ever. I actually built some antennas, uh, very innovative antennas for that. So so if you look at any industry, forget about the research uh, labs or the academic position, there are a very high percentage of people, they are they have PhDs. Which means these companies are hiring people who have PhD. Why? Because you know what PhD does? I believe that you know whichever profession you want to go, uh, either academic line or research line or in industry, is good to have a PhD degree. Because what do you do in PhD? What do you learn? You know, that question will be there in your mind, right? All of you are saying that, uh, um, why should I spend next uh, seven years of my life? You know, two years for master's and five years for PhD. Uh, why should I do this? Uh, wh what is there for me? What will happen to me afterwards? Let me tell you why I think that way. Because, you know, what you do during your PhD is that you learn how to solve problems. Because what you are learning right now in your undergraduate is that some theories, how things work, right? Uh, and then when you are put in uh, in that environment of a PhD, that you are trying, you are the for the first time trying to solve something that has not been solved before. When you are studying undergraduate, you are studying something that has been already solved, right? If you are suppose you are learning, learning Maxwell's equation, someone Maxwell actually already uh, James Clark. Maxwell only solved those equations and you are learning how that works, how you can apply that knowledge to something else. But in PhD, you are given a problem that, okay, you know, this thing that not, has not been solved, 
uh, can you work on it? Can you really try to find out, you know, uh, what you need to do to get a solution for that? So that is, and then you are thrown in that kind of environment and you'll have to find your way in the process. You, you know, this is a kind of a, one of the best training ground that you can have. Of course, you do some courses to learn more, but at the end of the day, you actually come up with a solution to a problem that no one has solved before. So uh, once you go through that training process, your thinking process changes. Because whenever you are faced with a problem, you are it does not appear to you as as daunting because you know we have gone through that already. That you know, once you are a graduate student doing a PhD, you'll find that lots of ups and downs. Today you are at the top of the world. You are thinking, oh, you know, something I was doing is working, and the next day again something is not working, and then you are at the bottom of the pit, thinking that oh, why I'm going through this? The life, you know, is really bad. So that kind of ups and downs you go through, in, and then that prepares you for real life, because. Real life is not a linear equation. You find that once you actually graduate, whatever you do afterwards in your life, from here, you'll find if you think that everything is going to run smooth, you are so wrong. But you can be assured that in the training that you are getting, that it will prepare you to handle those kind of situations because there'll be ups and downs. You suddenly your Suppose you go to industry afterward. From here, just join the industry. Fine, nothing wrong with it. And if you go there and if you are given a problem that you are not able to fix it, and your bo boss is coming and saying, you know, there is a deadline. You have to solve this. What do you do? It will happen. It is going to happen for sure. Then you have to prepare yourself. You have to think back. You know, saying that you know, let's see what we can do. And teamwork, you have to form teamwork. You know, as PhD also, one of the things that we do is we talk to our friends. You actually form a group, group of people, you talk to them and you find, you know, nowadays, the, some of the problems are so complex that it's almost impossible to solve it by yourself. So you need to have a team of people working on it. So how do you work in a team? You know, how do you uh, not letting your ego take over that oh, I am the I am the, I am the best. I know everything. You know, others they don't know. Uh, so you have to give up that kind of feeling, right? Because you, when you are in a team, everyone has to pull together in the same direction. Otherwise, you are not going to be successful. So uh, you know that's what the, at the end of the day, I this is my personal feeling that you know PhD gives a very good training to people that you know where to find solution you know how to find solution and that is important for everyday life right forget about you know phd or work or anything we deal with this kind of situation in daily life that uh, the decision what kind of decision to take and how that impacts uh, you know your life so i think it's important you guys should think about higher studies I, I have a very different take on this uh, because you know I am when I go to India and not only in India in other Europe and many other places that one of the thing that is asked of me is that we are finding nowadays the students they don't want to do uh, you know real engineering they want to go to software you know software is also engineering not, not that basically not uh, you know the traditional way of engineering they, everyone wants to go to software you know the world is falling apart what is wrong with the students and all those this these things they say I my take on that is don't blame the students because see you are going to do after your undergraduate suppose you want to take up a job for whatever reason or you can have financial reason or your you know, personal reason that you want to get a job. Where are you going to get a job? Wherever jobs are available. So, you know, if there are enough good jobs in your area of engineering, what you are doing, that chances are that you are going to apply to those jobs first. But if that is not available, then we cannot really tell you guys, the students that, you know, be pure. You know, we do, if you're doing uh, electronics engineering, you know, only take up job in electronics, hardware engineering, because that's what we have done. No, that should be wrong on our part. 
because you need a job and if the good jobs are not available for you in the field of work that you are studying then why should you be the you know that kind of you know i'll say stupid to stick to that area and not take up a job where jobs are available at some point of time in india india did well in software so even if people are doing engineering electronic engineering and all they are taking up jobs in software because software are giving good uh, you know salaries good, good future and it makes perfect sense to me look at the hardware development in india uh, there are not many places uh, uh, this kind of work is done that where you can actually get a good paying good prospect hardware development job where are those right so only some in defense like bel and few one or two uh, you know uh, companies who actually do microwave uh, kind of work there are not many companies right so my point my suggestion if advice if i may to give it to you is that you know of course you should try to be in, because you have already got trained in certain area so you know better little bit better than other area but never think that if you go to somewhere else you are not going to do well because at the undergraduate level what you have done you got your basics so at that time take up a job where you get a job and trying to find out what you enjoy what you really like and then you know try to you can change your job afterwards you know in india what happens is suppose there is an engineering job opening and they will hire only if you have engineering background if you know they will say very clearly that okay be or btech is needed suppose you have done bsc physics chances are very low that they are going to hire you for that position us it's not that way so it does not matter whether you have done engineering or you have done physics you have done chemistry you have done history it doesn't matter so if there is a job opening you of course they will ask for some kind of you know uh, kind of skill sets and all if you go there but if you can show we always take a chance in the sense that we see how that person is what kind of knowledge base that person has so other thing engineering stuff some of this stuff you can actually learn right uh you know suppose you have done physics you know the basics of transistors you know basics of ic's you know basic because in physics also you are learning you are actually learning more than an engineering person about the actual understanding actual physics behind that right and if that person comes and i see that two candidates and one of them has done physics and one of them has done engineering only difference in this country is that whether you are doing engineering or physics both of them actually four years of undergraduate in india that is not the case right you do 3 years of physics and 4 years of engineering yeah, so that's the, there is a one difference there but when they come and i we try to find out how you know how they how they think how they how how much they know not necessarily that relates to the engineering aspect of it and we have hired in our group we have people who have done physics phd in physics and they are doing engineering and they're so good because i always want to be a physicist <laughs> Uh, so because as physics you know that you know your outlook is very different you know these things so we have seen that people with diverse background there's so much you know they know so it does not matter what you studied as long as your basics are good you can uh, do well so in nasa's in terms of nasa you to your question that we have people from all kinds of background So you'll find, uh, you know, next to you, someone is a chemist. We need astrochemistry. No, we need to know chemistry. Of you know, you want to go there. We need to find that chemistry. We, know, we have physicists. We have astrophysicists. We have, you know, writers. You know, we don't emphasize on this writing aspect of it. We say, oh, I am an engineer. Why do I need to write well? No, if you're an engineer or whatever, you'll have to write well to present something. What you find in this country to become a doctor. you have to first do four years of undergraduate and then you go to medical school not like in india that after 12th grade you go straight to medicine that is not here so here you have to do four years of undergraduate first so people have done history for four years their major was history after that they became doctor so it is very open that's why people amongst us at, at nasa we have people from all diverse background 
and that makes it so rich because the person who actually working with me maybe i think that i know engineering better or something you know physics better but the person who is actually working with me he has philosophy degree and but working with us and then in the, we are in a group we are trying to you know go through some project and he brings he or she brings a completely different perspective to the problem because they are thinking from a different angle i am thinking of my engineering side right because my i'm trained to think in certain way but that person is thinking completely differently so i always tell the students like you that when you get a chance to go back to your college you know that uh, <laughs> when you get that opportunity you should hang out with all kinds of people so if you are ec or electronics you should not just hang out with your electronics friends you should hang out with people who are doing chemical engineering you do are mechanical engineering and you not know, chat Uh, so uh, when i came to us and i became i came to know about you know we had at you know sir virginia we had you know student branch like the way you have and then i joined in and i learned a lot through that because what i feel it does it actually brings you this opportunities of networking you know is a very diverse group of people and the people are there you know all the way up to very you know elderly person who has so much of experience to young people like you and then they're all getting together uh and then they're discussing and you're learning from them you're learning from their experiences so this main thing that it helps you is this networking because you know you're looking for a job and you know that you meet someone in, through your IEEE uh you know event and then person say you know what yes uh, i can help you because it's kind of a that kind of community uh sense because we discuss about our problems you know i typically has so many all you know how i typically is broken up different societies and all i am involved in two different societies one is micro theory and technique society and antenna and propagation society so i now i am an uh, administrative committee member of mtt society that i typically the society will provide funding for the, they select a couple of people every year from all over the world and you guys can ask for a distinguished lecturer that person will go and give talk and interact with people so basically you are then exposed to what is happening in terms of you know they can be in research they can be in industry for all areas and then you know what is going on you are hearing from an expert about how things are done these contacts these networkings are very very useful so i am so glad to see that you guys are actually becoming part of ieee that gives you this because this is the largest professional network so again main thing is that helps you in networking these contacts are so important in your life you will realize as you actually go to your uh, professional career that these contacts are very very important um you know uh, what are ufos ufos are unidentified flying objects right okay. if you actually go and see many of this unidentified unidentified object we don't know right so in this case of that what uh, pentagon has uh, released that there is some kind of thing that's flying around i don't know what that is uh, because if i tell that i knew uh, i i won't be telling you the truth because i don't know uh my belief is that if we look deep into that we'll be able to find out we'll be able to explain and so that's my uh, you know position on those uh, your force always uh, you know uh, my mother used to say something uh, when uh, i was young we were all young and then i i still actually remember that then she used to say that in bengali and she used to say that okay i after that when i became you know kind of going to nasa she, uh, she said that aakash ke chute chao kintu pa jayno matite thake in the sense that you, you can you want to touch the sky fine but keep your feet on the ground so this thing is very very important uh, you know i read that is not my own uh, word but you know definition of how do, how do you define success what is the definition of success i i really like that that 
if you look back your life and if you can smile about it i think that's what success is and i really believe that uh, and uh, that with that thought i want to end this and i want i wish all the best for all of you i know it's a difficult time but it will pass you know in human we are human beings we are really resilient and i think it will pass and we'll come back more stronger on the other side